I was five when my, when my father died. And for some months, I didn't show any major symptoms of trauma. But then I, I developed this, this nightmare, which was horrible and it was repetitive. In this nightmare, I was completely hopeless. I couldn't see either mother or father around. And the whole thing was quite scary, so much so that I told my mother that I didn't want to sleep at all. And this is when she realized I needed help. And then she took me to a psychotherapist. I don't exactly know what he did because I don't have a lot of, of memories of this process. I, what I remember is, is going to those sessions and playing with toys and, and talking, but, but not directly about, about the events uh, of my father's death. But then he very, very subtly, he led me to believe that I could change the course of the dream, that I could have some degree of autonomy, some degree of consciousness, and that I could change that, that dream script. And after that, I, the dream changed. And I was a, a detective looking for a, a, a mad criminal. I was I was hunting a tiger in the in the jungle. And I also had a, a male friend, an adult friend. And at some point he says, I cannot go on with you. You need to go by yourself now. And then I accepted that, and, and I moved alone towards, uh, you know, uh, finding that tiger. Then the tiger finds me, and I had to flee and, and jump in, in the water and swim. And there was a big shark there. In the end, I felt like I was, I was going through an adventure and I was overcoming the fear. It was about overcoming the fear of going alone. And then after that third dream, I, the, the, this, these dreams ceased. They, they stopped. Dreams are basically an expression of what's going on, but we may not be conscious of that at all. And that's why they're so precious. Hmm. You know, sometimes I struggle with that idea of that, that the dreams are actually telling us something real because um, my, my dad passed away last year and um, hearing you describe that, like I, I, had I had dreams, they were the most vivid dreams I've had in my life. And um, and part of me wants to like, 
dissociate them from my reality, like sort of have them be in their own space. But what you're describing feels like, uh, like almost like dreams are a window into, into our minds, into some deeper consciousness, um, rather than a random assortment of things that just like happen in our mind. So there's a level of noise, of a level of unpredictability in dreams. They're not random at all. But their genesis, their, their motor is f entirely not random. Uh, this is very clear when you lose somebody you love. They're not random at all. If dreams were random, you would not have repetitive dreams about anything. And especially at those moments when we are suffering and we go through grief and we, we, we have recurrent dreams, this cannot be produced by a random process. This has to be produced by a meaningful process. This is Siddhartha Ribeiro. I'm a neuroscientist from Brazil. I'm at the Brain Institute of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. My laboratory focuses on memory, sleep, and dreams. Siddhartha also wrote the book, The Oracle of Night, The History and Science of Dreams. Dreams are a process of adaptation. Dreams have to do with preparing the dreamer for the next day. They're not random at all. After my dad passed and he began showing up in my dreams, I found myself thinking back to a conversation we'd had a few years earlier. It's the only time I can remember my dad explicitly talking about dreams. It all started when my mom mentioned that a mysterious thing had happened to a friend of hers. She dreamed about a loved one right at the moment that loved one died. My mom believed God was sending her friend a message in that dream. But my dad kind of chuckled and said, dreams don't work like that. He was a doctor who specialized in helping people with sleep issues, after all. If I'm being honest, he probably would have trolled me for making this episode. Eh, bad dreams. It's probably sleep apnea, he would say. But there was no convincing my mom. She reminded him that she knew she'd have two daughters years before me and my sister came along because two cats with green eyes had come to her in a dream. We both have green eyes. For a long time, I wasn't sure who was right. I made the mistake of thinking it was an either-or. Dreams either meant nothing, or they were the key to unlocking everything. But now, when I see my dad in a dream, and he tells me he's proud of me, that I'm doing okay, well, I don't know what to make of that exactly. Is it God? Is it my mind trying to heal itself? Is it just a bad night's sleep? Is it all three? These questions are probably not that much different than the ones you're asking. Over the last few weeks, we've received dozens of messages from listeners detailing their dreams. Many of them are rooted in the anxiety felt during 2020, the first year of COVID. Fears about the chaos of the world make it into our dreams. We mourn those we've lost. We escape the confines of our waking minds. We find joy in absurdity. We escape into ourselves in our dreams. And for thousands of years, dreams have helped humans find meaning. They've inspired creativity, pushed people towards innovation, and even sparked conflict. They're not random at all. I'm Rand Abdel Fattah. I'm Ramtin Arablui. And on this episode of Throughline from NPR, we're taking a journey through the history of dreams. Now in 2022, in what's shaping up to be another difficult year, we explore how humans have used dreams to find meaning in our waking lives. My name is Samantha Alexander. I'm from Romance, Arkansas, and you're listening to Throughline from NPR. 
Support for NPR comes from Newman's Own Foundation, working to nourish the common good by donating all profits from Newman's Own food products to charitable organizations that seek to make the world a better place. More information is available at newmansownfoundation.org. Part 1. The Science of Sleep Dreams are a process of adaptation. Dreams have to do with preparing the dreamer for the next day, for the following day. When we go to sleep, our brain will enter a a sequence of different phases. Phase one, the brain slows down, the body relaxes, muscles twitch. Which will be characterized by very different brain waves and very different uh, chemicals released in the brain. Phase two, body temperature drops. Bursts of brain activity happen in waves. Your eyes stop moving, your muscles relax. Everything slows down. And then about 90 minutes after you fall asleep, rapid eye movements start. You enter your first cycle of REM sleep. Dreaming occurs during most of the time, but it's not very vivid until about halfway through the the sleep. The first one is short, but the cycles get longer and longer as you move in and out of deep sleep and dreaming sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep. REM sleep is characterized by very, very strong activation of neurons in the cerebral cortex. So much so that some scientists called it paradoxical sleep because it it feels like uh, the brain is awake even though it's asleep. But neurochemically, things are not the same as during waking. So some neurotransmitters, such as norepinephrine and serotonin, are not released at all during REM sleep. And this will cause the reactivation of memories that occurs during REM sleep to be much more uh, free. Memories tend to associate in quite unpredictable manners. Also during REM sleep, the prefrontal regions of the brain are not activated. So this means that we lack the ability to inhibit behaviors. We lack the ability to uh, feel odds during the dream and wake up. We we tend to take the bizarreness of dreams as a very natural thing during dreaming. And we we go along, we continue. (laughs) We we basically follow the, the threat. And this is quite different. If things like that happen during waking, we would pause and say, oh, this is wrong. There's something, there's something here that doesn't fit. But we, we often don't, don't get this feeling during dream. If I had to, to draw a dream, this would be patches of memories with an, an overall tone that is given by desire. They're in black and white. And every time I turned around, all of them had their masks on. And we were having races down, like flights of stairs. You'd see memories being reactivated, guided by desires and fears. We were just eating waffles. And I had to like swim over to their room and like hold my breath. 
in ways that are reminiscent of the waking life but that mix things that happened yesterday with things that happened when you were a child. I just vividly remember trying to grab hold of his vision. And... There's no censorship. There's no mind telling you, you shouldn't be dreaming that, you shouldn't be visualizing this. Uh, quite the opposite. We tend to, to go into those repressed areas that we often cannot visit, but then during dreaming we can visit. And we will visit because, in fact, what dr the dreams are doing is to present us with images that synthesize, that, that express what we are going through. They can give us a lot of insights into what's going on, and we may not be aware of what's going on. Dreams are the source of new ideas, and they have been the source of new ideas from the very beginning. Our ability to daydream is very likely a reflection of our ability to night dream. If you look into the brain areas that are involved in daydream, they're the same as those involved in night dream. When we plan something in the future, when we travel in the past, when we tell a story about our own life, when we make a story up, all those situations involve activation of those brain regions that, that we need to have empathy, to be able to put ourselves in other shoes. Uh, so very likely what allowed our ancestors to develop technology, to develop new ideas, to develop culture and, and, and enter this process of accumulation of culture is something that was propelled by dreams. Zora Neale Hurston, the celebrated early 20th century novelist, wrote a sentence that has always stuck with me. The dream is the truth. These five words express a grand idea that our dreams can reveal truths to us that we cannot access when we're awake. It's a place where we're completely free from the confines of our self-awareness. And when we try to make sense of our dreams, we can find meaning in our own thoughts and desires. According to Siddhartha Ribeiro, for thousands of years, we humans have made art, technology, and imagined new futures inspired by the dreams we experience almost every night. When we come back, we meet our ancestors in a cave of forgotten dreams. My name is Fonz Howard. I'm from Jacksonville, North Carolina, and I'm listening to Throughline from NPR. Support for NPR and the following message come from Yogi T. These days, self-care can feel like just another task on your never-ending to-do list. But finding time for yourself doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, it can be as simple as brewing yourself a cup of Yogi Honey Chai Turmeric Vitality Tea. Step away from the chaos of the day and support your well-being with this delicious blend of turmeric and warming chai spices. Support your well-being with Yogi Tea. Part 2. Messages from the Deep. In December 1994, three explorers were making their way through a big, complex set of caves in southern France. They walked through vast chambers, and as they got deeper into the caves, skulls and bones of bears littered the ground before them. Scratches surrounded them on the walls and the rocks. And then... Through the light of their flashlights, they saw something shocking. 
there were mysterious paintings on the walls depicting life in an ancient world. Human handprints in various sizes, geometric shapes, human figures, and animals. Lions, bison, horses, bears. Species that lived in Europe during the Upper Paleolithic era, around 30,000 years ago. They would come to be known as the Chauvet Cave Paintings. These works of art were made by people who would have been recognizable to us, people who on some level must have valued art, because they had to go to some great lengths just to make them. This art is not produced at the entrance, at the very entrance of the caves, but very deep in the caves. They had to go for, for hundreds of meters, and then they, they needed to use fire to be able to, to draw or paint. The paintings come in two colors, black and red. They run across the cave wall like some ancient message left behind for future people to discover. And here's what makes them even trippier. If you use a torch fire to illuminate the caves in just the right way, the paintings appear to be animated. For example, when, when you have like a bison, uh, the bison has many legs. It doesn't have four legs, it has more legs. And this seems to be uh, an attempt to, to produce the, the impression of motion. As the filmmaker Werner Herzog said, these paintings could be considered the first works of cinema. those paintings that are not just beautiful and, and impressive, but they are also suggestive of, of magic, of, of mental imagery that was, had some purpose, that was the mixture of people and other animals. A, a human torso with a bison head, for example. Where did these wild images come from? How did our ancient ancestors pull ideas from the recesses of their minds and place them onto a rock canvas? Siddhartha believes that the key to answering these questions comes from dreams. And this is probably a function that was facilitated by dreaming, by REM sleep that conduces uh, uh, a reactivation of memories that is not very strict, that is quite lax. Now, if we transport ourselves 30,000 years uh, in the past and we imagine these situations, the only logical thing to, be, to, to conclude is that people would come out of those dreams absolutely sure that they had encountered godly entities in, in, in search of, of guidance. All right, so let's address the obvious question. How does Siddhartha know all this? How can anyone know anything about the intentions of people 30,000 years ago? Well, the reality is, no one knows for sure. These are theories based on his reading of evidence. He and other scholars are decoding messages from human beings that lived in a completely different world. They're inferring intentions from outcomes. In this spirit, Siddhartha contends that because these cave paintings contain so many fantastical elements, particularly the melding of animal and human, the animation, etc., we can conclude on some level that prehistoric humans were engaging with their dreams that they were taking them seriously. And if you don't have any other theory about what dreaming is like, why would you doubt that, right? Why would you wake up in the morning saying, mm, I had this dream about this, this uh, Lord of the Beasts with big antlers that came and helped me uh, 
plan my, my hunt. But no, this is probably illusion. No, this is not the conclusion that our ancestors uh, took. Quite, quite, quite in contrary. They, they concluded that those dreams were a, a proof of the existence of those entities and they should be paid attention. So all those things point to a very rich mental life. These ancestors of ours were dreaming. All non-aquatic mammals have REM sleep. So we, it's safe to say that our ancestors in the Paleolithic were dreaming a lot. In the dream... Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream you wanted to dream. In the dream was my father. All oh, that we see or see is but a dream within a dream. My recent dream was that I was hanging out with Mr. Rogers. I'm currently 30 weeks pregnant and had a recent dream that the skin on my belly was translucent. And I thanked him for being a stable part of my life growing up. And I could look in and see that my baby was screaming, help, help, over and over again. 48 now, so I've been writing my dreams down a very long time. And it was very disturbing. <laughs> I was very pleased to wake up from that one. As far as we look back, our ancestors were dreaming, and as soon as they had language, they were sharing those dreams. If he gazed toward the right, his adversary will die. If he gazed toward the left, his adversary will overcome him. This is from a dream tablet written over 3,000 years ago in Babylon. If you look backward, he will not attain his desire. This is some of the oldest evidence of dream interpretation ever recorded. And it shows us that in many parts of the world, for millennia, dreams played an important role in waking life. If you're disconnected from that, if you just live from waking life to waking life and you never remember your dreams and you never share your dreams with anybody and you never take your dreams into consideration for any decision, you're living a life that is entirely different from the lives of our ancestors. We did not evolve to, to have this lack of relationship to dreams. We evolved with dreams. Dreams were important to define what we are. And I think that a lot of what people are feeling nowadays, this sense that we are going nowhere, this sense that we are going alone, this sense that we have no roots, that we have no connection to the past, this, I think, is, has to do with our lack of sleep and lack of dreaming. You know, it's interesting because you mentioned that um, dreams are a way to, uh, you know, on the one hand, and from a positive perspective, they're a way to imagine our way out of a problem. But on the other hand, they're also uh, potentially misleading. Well, Rand, I think you, you, you're you touching a, a very good point here, which is that dreams are simulations of possible futures, which means that they are often wrong. Uh, and that's why in all those ancient cultures, there is the need for dream interpretation. From ancient times all the way up to the Middle Ages, dreams were often used to try to predict future events. Special people in society were assigned the role of interpreting dreams. You can see this in many texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Bible, and the Quran. People were very serious about it. Even ancient rulers like Alexander the Great and Xerxes used dreams to predict victories in battle. And in many indigenous cultures around the world, dream interpretations were taken into consideration when making decisions, sometimes even for entire communities. Dreams should not be taken at face value. Dreams, and, and people knew this in, uh, across cultures. People knew it in, in, in the ancient world. Now, dreams have been, of course, appropriated for political reasons many, many times. In the Roman Empire, it happened all the time. For example, Julius Caesar had a dream, well, reported a dream, when he was less than 30, in which he would have sex with his mother. 
And this dream was used politically many, many years later when he crossed the, the Rubicon and, and invaded uh, Rome and, and, and caused a civil war. This dream was used at this moment politically to say that he was, um, that the dream was actually a good, a good uh, premonition because he was having intercourse with his mother, so he was taking control of the motherland. In all different cultures, a dream could decide a war, a dream could decide the end of a war, a dream could decide uh, whether kings would marry or, 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 or make peace with, different, uh, with their neighbors. In a way, until the end of the Middle Ages, dreams were the only, the only possible light into the future. It was noisy, it was metaphorical, it was imprecise, but was nevertheless some sort of insight into the future. However, in the past 500 years, two things started to develop very strongly, which opposed the importance of dreams. And those are capitalism on one hand, and science on the other hand. Capitalism and science have been developing hand to hand, together, intertwined, one feeding uh, the other. And then after the development of, of proper science, and that I think is related to capitalism, the insight into the future became technical, scientific. With the advent of science and reason, the need for mysticism and finding meaning through dreams became less relevant. During the Enlightenment in Europe, dream interpretation began to be seen as mere superstition. Philosophers like René Descartes trivialized dreams. This trend continued with the rise of modern science, because why would you need a dream to help you predict future events when you have a scientific method to test ideas and algorithms that can base predictions on data? However, I think it's a, it was a mistake, and it is a mistake for us, to replace one with the other, because what the, the kind of insight we can get from dreams is very different from the insight we get from science. In the 19th and early 20th century, some philosophers and psychologists began to recognize and study dreams. One particular scientist from Austria sparked a movement with a radical idea about how dreams can help us understand mental illness. That story, when we come back. Hi, this is Felicia Manley from Chicago, Illinois, and you're listening to Throughline from NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Kay Buxbaum in support of the David Gilkey and Zabiula Tamana Memorial Fund, established to strengthen NPR's commitment to training and protecting journalists in high-risk environments. Part 3. What Dreams May Come For much of human history, dreams were considered messages from the deep. They were a source of inspiration, of ideas, and even guided the way many people lived their lives. But beginning in the 16th century in Europe, dreams lost much of their power. The Christian church saw dreams as a possible source of sin. Some philosophers regarded dream interpretation as nonsense. One writer thought they were merely the result 
of indigestion. And by the 19th century, most scientists saw dreams as just something our bodies do while we sleep. Nothing more than the wiring hidden inside the walls of a house. As long as it functioned, that was all that mattered. But then, in the late 1800s, in Austria, a man came along who questioned that approach. I started my professional activity as a neurologist, trying to bring relief to my neurotic patients. Sigmund Freud was one of the first scientists who thought deeply about dreams and attempted to better understand the science behind them and the emotions and behaviors they conjured. When Freud was a young doctor, he was a scientist. He saw himself as a scientist. And he was trying himself in different fields of science, of neuroscience. At this time, scientists were trying to understand the connection between the brain and the mind, the body and consciousness. One of the most common diagnoses of the time was hysteria. It was often a kind of catch-all diagnosis for people, especially women, who might have been suffering from symptoms like depression, anxiety, shortness of breath, insomnia, and even something called sexual forwardness. When Sigmund Freud was a medical student studying hysteria, he came to believe that it was a psychiatric disorder. And after graduating, he opened his own private practice to treat patients and further study the condition. And until the very end of the 19th century, he was pursuing uh, a clinical work that was very strongly rooted in the, in the neuroscience and psychiatry of his time. But then... His father died. I find it difficult to write just now. The old man's death has affected me profoundly. With his peculiar mixture of deep wisdom and fantastic lightheartedness, he had a significant effect on my life. I now feel quite uprooted. He entered the crisis and had these major dreams. And this is when he, he undergoes the big change. There is still very little happening to me externally, but internally, something very interesting. For the last four days, my self-analysis has continued in dreams and has presented me with the most valuable elucidations and clues. This is when he produces his seminal book, The Interpretation of Dreams, and, and creates a new a new uh, field of, of knowledge that we call psychoanalysis. Out of these findings grew a new science, psychoanalysis, a part of psychology and a new method of treatment of the neuroses. Psychoanalysis is the idea that investigating the unconscious, often through dreams, can possibly treat the psychological symptoms patients are suffering, conditions or neuroses that people still experience today, like depression, anxiety, obsessive behavior, and so on. Using his own dreams and his patients as evidence, Freud put forth an idea in a book called The Interpretation of Dreams that would become his lasting legacy. What Freud did that was so important is that he reclaimed dreams as something meaningful. But even after Freud published his book, it's not like everything instantly changed. Dreams were still mostly dismissed in the scientific community. Why? Because in the 19th century, science was completely sure that dreams, dreams were nonsense, that nobody should pay attention to dreams, that they reflected, at most, uh, bad digestion. It would take eight years to sell the first 600 copies of The Interpretation of Dreams. And for the first year and a half, no scientific journal reviewed it, besides some psychological ones, where Freud's book received negative reviews. One prominent psychologist warned that, quote, uncritical minds would be delighted to join in this play with ideas and would end up in complete mysticism and chaotic arbitrariness. People did not believe in my facts and thought my theories unsavory. Resistance was strong and unrelenting. And the people that believed that dreams had a meaning 
were the superstitious people that were not educated, that were buying those those manuals that, you know, those Pulp Fiction manuals that uh, give you a fixed uh, relationship between dream symbols and, and specific meanings. Something that is very old that still exists today, right? And and Freud was able to, to say that they were both wrong. What is common in all these dreams is obvious. They completely satisfy wishes excited during the day, which remain unrealized. They are simply and undisguisedly realizations of wishes. He would say, dreams have a meaning. They are related to people's lives. They are not something that can be dismissed, but they also cannot be predetermined. If you want to make sense of somebody's dream, you need to understand that person. You need to listen to that person. You need to share the context of that person. And this is what is done in psychoanalysis and in psychotherapy in general. So Freud was able to say, yes, dreams have a meaning, but this meaning is centered in the dreamer. This idea that people dream for a reason, that it's a way to cope with problems the conscious mind can't do while it's awake, was radical. That by reflecting on your dreams, you were confronting something deep inside of you that followed like a shadow you didn't know was there. Dreams are meaningful if we pay attention to them. So it's it's a relationship that we build, not just with ourselves, but with those mental creatures that inhabit ourselves. Our minds are filled with with creatures that we, people, people that we met, people that are fictional, people that we met a long time ago and we imagine how they are now. So those creatures are, they have, they, they evolve in our minds throughout our lives. There, ha, there has been proposed 120 years ago by Sigmund Freud, and then Carl Jung said similar things, and science dismissed that for a long period of time. And, and one thing I do in my book, The Oracle of Night is to defend the legacy of psychoanalysis and to show that, in fact, many of the things that were proposed about dreams at the turn of the 20th century ended up being corroborated, verified by science. dreams. I mean, generally, one forgets them almost as soon as one wakes up. Should one take notes and remember them? Oh, absolutely. Write them down immediately. Um, If you wake up during the night with a dream, write it down. Uh, Don't doze. Don't go back to sleep. Flying in the air. I felt like I was a wave. But I, like, went up to them and I was like, please take me with you. Please take me with you. And they were like, you have blood on your head. I was a part of the Soviet army, and I accidentally blew up this huge effigy of Stalin. I was hell-bent on proving to people that I had hung out with Elliot Page, the actor, in Brooklyn. And then it becomes a full-blown hurricane. I just remember my car being tossed around, basically. And then I went downstairs, and I found people were rolling refrigerators around. And I've lost my script, and the producer is drunk, and everything goes to pieces, and the microphone catches on fire. After Freud's death in 1939, it still took some time for his work on dreams to be taken as serious science. And even though today most psychologists disagree with Freud's findings, particularly as it relates to the use of dreams to treat psychological conditions— Other scientists have picked up the mantle and dug deeper into the science of dreaming. The science of dreaming has evolved. Uh, Many things that were dismissed uh, in the 50s and 60s are the hottest science uh, nowadays, including lucid dreaming. In the 80s and 90s, to study dreams was, was bad for people's career like studying psychedelics. And nowadays it's it's hot, and now now it's something that is trendy. After Freud, there were others who continued to pursue the study of dreams and the unconscious mind, specifically another well-known psychoanalyst, Carl Jung. He believed that human beings are connected to each other and their ancestors through a shared set of experiences that are embedded in our DNA, an idea he called the collective unconscious. 
we are not isolated, right? We are not living an experience, each of us, that is disconnected from everybody else. Rather, the contrary. We, have, we go through things in our lives, even though our lives are quite different, but we go through things that are quite similar. We're all born, we need to be fed, we need to be taken care of, we grow up, we go through puberty. So all those things, right? If you, if you have a long life, you will go through all those phases which are shared with other people. As time went on, more and more studies on dreams and the unconscious continued to build on one another. And almost 125 years after Freud first published The Interpretation of Dreams, there's now research that supports the idea that dreams can have a significant impact on our waking life. We had to wait until 2010 for the first paper that showed that when you dream about a task, you become better at completing that task. They show that when people navigate um, a virtual uh, maze and they dream about it, they become much better at navigating. And that does not happen if they stay awake thinking about the maze or if they sleep without dreaming about the maze. Uh, so, so, so dream about something has a lot to do with succeeding in doing that. Uh, and this is something that many, many people believed uh, for, for ages, but there was no empirical demonstration of that until quite recently. As all of this was playing out in the scientific world, the human experience was changing. Freud grew up during a time before electricity was widely available, when the sun and moon dictated sleeping patterns, when daily life revolved around the seasons. In today's world, where sleep is being cut short, caffeinated drinks are keeping us awake, and screens vie for our attention, it's become harder and harder to dream. We did not evolve to have this lack of relationship to dreams. We evolved with dreams. Dreams were important to define what we are. And I think that a lot of what people are feeling nowadays, this sense that we are going nowhere, the sense that we are going alone, the sense that we have no roots, that we have no connection to the past. This, I think, is, has to do with our lack of sleep and lack of dreaming. People are in increasingly sleeping later and later because there's a lot to draw our t attention, a lot of stimulation going on, a lot of work going on, and this creates a situation in which people will go to sleep after midnight, and they need to wake up early anyway. So that means they will cut short the second half of the night, they will cut short the REM phase, and therefore they will have less, they will have less dreaming. But even when they have good dreaming, the fact that they wake up in the morning and, and, and move right away from, from bed will make the recall of dreams almost impossible. You can remember that you had a dream, but you cannot remember that dream. And, and this is something that has to be discussed in society because it has a profound effect on people's emotions, on people's cognitive abilities, right? If you, if you have a bad night of sleep, you will have cognitive deficits. And this is like a, a social snowball. Once you wake up like that, you will interact with other people and this will grow. And I think Many of the problems they were facing nowadays of intolerance, people being, you know, angry all the time, this has to do with, among other things, sleep and dreaming. I really feel that we need to focus on what is important. And, and the way to do that is to go inwards, is to go towards our inner world, is to find meaning between the representation of ourselves and those mental creatures that we carry with us. If we have no relationship to those, it's very hard to have ethics. It's very hard to have a moral compass. The moral compass will not come from capitalism. It will not come from science only. It has to come from a richer relationship with the inner world. And this is what dreams are all about.
That's it for this week's episode. I'm Ramtin Arablouei. I'm Randa Abdel Fattah, and you've been listening to Throughline from NPR. This episode was produced by me and me and Lawrence Wu, Lane Kaplan Levinson, Julie Kane, Victor Ibeyes, Yolanda Sanguini. Fact checking for this episode was done by Kevin Vogel. Thanks also to Adriana Tapia for her production on this episode, Deb George for editing help, Tamar Charney, and Anya Grunman. Thank you to Casey Herman for his voiceover work. This episode was mixed by Andy Huther. Music for this episode was composed by Ramtin and his band, Drop Electric, which includes... Naveed Marvi, Sho Fujiwara, Anya Mizani. Also, we want your voice on our show. Send us a voicemail at 872-588-8805 with your name, where you're from, and the line, you're listening to Throughline from NPR, and we'll get you on the show. That's 872-588-8805. And finally, if you have an idea or like something you heard on the show, please write us at throughline at npr.org or hit us up on Twitter at throughline NPR. Thanks for listening.